Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, live this morning and um, apologies for the slight delay. I'm sure everyone is very used to, to the technical issues that the, the current climate uh, presents us with. Um, but thank you for being here. Um, I am thrilled to be uh, co-hosting this event and uh, we've got a very exciting panel with us today to discuss the topic of the new permitted development rights. Um, I'm going to hand over to each member of the panel quickly before I give you a brief overview view uh, just to introduce themselves and uh, so we can see what they'll be uh, bringing to the discussion today. Um, Anita, I would love to start with you. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Anita Cassine. I am a planning and environment lawyer. Uh, I am a legal director at Blake Morgan. Um, before that, I used to be um, the head of planning and environment at Howard Kennedy. And before that, um, the head of legal at Heathrow Airport and I was dealing with the expansion of the airport. Thank you. Brendan, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Good morning. Hi, I'm Brendan Geraghty. I'm an architect and I'm one of the founding um, partners in Geraghty Taylor. We're, we're, we're a practice that does a lot of um, residential and office work and we've done quite a bit of uh, PD conversion work as well um, and so I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Hi, um, I think it's me next. I'm um, Jill Eaton from ICD Projects. We're planning consultants and I'm an associate in the, the um, planning team. We work across four offices in the UK. I'm based in London and I've been working in development management area of planning for 22 years, including some recent experience with the local planning authority. So it's quite useful to see from both sides. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Leif Mubarak. I am the acquisitions director for Click. We are a leading uh, airspace developer in the UK. Um, we have around circa 800 homes over the next four to five years to build on rooftops and we've just pressed the button on setting up our, our own permanent off-site facility um, and obviously permitted development is of, of, of huge interest to us. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so just to set the scene a little bit, um, last month, August, uh, we saw some changes in the planning system, uh, namely to the permitted development rights uh, regime and uh, one of those was the extension um, the extension of the rights to include upward extensions to dwelling houses subject to a number of different uh, restrictions and conditions um, this was obviously with the intent um, to further the government's manifesto to build 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 but has unfortunately been marred with uh, quite a bit of contestation from various campaigners and organizations who are um, uh, frustrated and also uh, considering the changes to be somewhat unlawful, um, granting them a um, court date in October to um, actually uh, challenge these rights. Um, I wanted to start, uh, the purpose of us having this conversation today is to work through um, some of those issues and to also understand the position of various stakeholders in the market at the moment, uh, given the fact that those rights are still um, uh, accessible and they're still in play. There hasn't been a um, recession on those. So um, what I would like to start with is perhaps the concept of cutting through some of the media noise and discussing the intent of these rights, theoretically, what they were planning to do, whether, again, in theory, they will serve to expedite housing delivery, um, and also uh, some of the conditions that approvals that remain in place, which are important to bear in mind. Um, Anita, um, may we start with you? Of course. So the, the context of these permitted development rights, which allow extensions um, uh, to dwelling houses, but also to commercial, existing commercial and mixed uses, is um, I think it's twofold. There's a there's a, a wider economic rationale behind it because of the times we're living in. Uh, needs to be supported and boosted, um, and we also um, need to regenerate redundant and vacant buildings. 
and permitted development rights are, are seen as a quick and less bureaucratic way as a legal mechanism um, for, for helping developers um, achieve that type of development. It will also regenerate towns centres. Times like these where people are working from home and not travelling into city centres. Um, that, that's the wider rationale. Philosophically, permitted development rights as a legal mechanism are, have lots of positives uh, about them, and which is probably why the governments look to using this mechanism. They're seen as less costly than full planning applications less time consuming. Any prior approvals that you need to get um, really are meant to be a light touch look at the detail because the principle of the development already is granted planning permission through permitted development. So yeah, that, that's the great thing. There's lots of positives surrounding uh, the use of the government um, in introducing these PDRs to regenerate the economy. Um, and I actually think it's good for small businesses, small and medium sized businesses who want to cut through the red tape, cut through the noise and help deliver um, on housing. From my perspective, this is a positive mechanism. I know later in the discussion we're going to get into sort of the nitty gritty of um, the detail, but th th that's my take on it at the moment at a high level. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anita. Um, Jill, can we come over to you for your thoughts? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, we've seen PDRs through from various different areas. So it's it's there's been lots of consultation and discussion in advance of the PDRs coming in through uh, rooftop editions. It's just really important to check to get professional advice and to check the details because they're often very prescriptive and have very specific criteria which you have to meet. So in effect, the local authority are just are not considering the principle. As Anita says, that's granted planning permission. It's going through the technical detail. And in this case, the matters which the local authority have to consider are wider than they have been in other PDR situations. So there's more scope to um, for the authority to consider the specifics so therefore make sure you've got advice you've scoped things out you've done your homework in effect to see if they apply to you that's great thank you um brendan from your perspective uh what do you think some of the positive aspects of these changes are i mean i think the the, the spirit of these is a positive one in the sense that we, we do have a housing crisis a very, very significant one, and, and, and we're going to need as many approaches as, as we can, practical approaches as we can think of to solve that, including the reuse of old buildings and, and or, or perhaps redundant buildings. And I think that, you know, despite the fact that there have been some very unscrupulous developers who really exploited the spirit of the um, of, 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 of this legislation to produce poor quality uh, accommodation, there were others that didn't do that and actually um, managed to produce something which was which 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 had value, and also I think local authorities when they when they were planning departments when they were dealing them you know it, it, it took a, a few projects for everybody to understand quite what options they did have, and 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 really now we we see them exercising uh, quite a lot of influence and, and and intervening on all sorts of levels to get a better quality of uh, accommodation coming out. So I think the spirit of this, I think, is good. I, and we need, we really do need to find a way to make it work. But checks and balances are very, very important. And um, um, perhaps that's an area that we, we, we could improve on to to to, to speed up the, 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 the process and, and make sure the quality is there. Thanks, Brendan. Leith, coming over to you, what, what are your thoughts seeing as you're on, uh, I guess, what we would deem the sharp end of this issue? I mean, look, we, we all know this, this has been brought in to sort of streamline uh, the process and bring greater planning certainty, boost housing delivery. But really, we've got to look at uh, there is land is scarce. You know, homes aren't being built. We need to reduce the need for greenfield sites, and and this is why it's brought in now for us as an airspace developer. Obviously, fantastic. You know, you bring in upwards extensions, and and we can we can crack on and build more homes now it hasn't really changed anything in the way we work there are still so many different technical aspects that we have to that we have to follow through with um and there's even a design aspect to it as well um I, 
for me, I think that you know a lot of the talk about it sort of just yeah, you can just stick two stories on top of the on top of the building is completely incorrect. We still have to go through the full due process, and and that's good. It is essentially an in principle agreement to build up should you meet the technical aspects, and and uh, there are a lot more constraints to it than the, than the old sort of the, the original permitted development of this resi. Thanks very much, Leith. Um, I appreciate the panel highlighting those points um, and that it's important to uh, strip back what's what's been reported and actually get into the nitty gritty of um, what these rights actually mean. And again, looking at the checks and balances that are still very, very present. Um, something which I think our listeners and um, uh, people who are watching right now would really like to know is what should be done right now? Um, so there are there's obviously going to be a, a a relatively short tail until we get to the the court hearing around challenging these and also probably a very long one thereafter what can what should stakeholders do now and also how does the aspect of financing these projects fit into this whole picture um and what sort of opportunities are there that can still be um comfortably used at the moment um uh, brendan may i begin with you I mean, I, I think I think it's quite I think it's quite difficult at the moment, but I think Leith summed it up really quite well when he said, "Do your homework." Uh, this is an uh, this is a sort of an, an invitation and in principle to develop in a particular direction, and if you meet the technical requirements, then you know you should it, it should be able to go forward. So I, I think that that summarizes the 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 the, the sort of the approach and the strategy very, very well. There's some interesting, you know, there's some in terms of the design checks and balances, there's some very important stuff putting that we need to think about. You know, just putting two stories on a building doesn't necessarily make the building function. There can be, you know, there needs there, 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 there are things around access. The height of the building may may warrant the inclusion of sprinklers in the round rather than just on the extension. It's a complex set of areas. It's a, it's a complex undertaking. So I think that to consider it as a, two, as, as a very simple thing is is incorrect, but doing our homework, making sure that the, the technical requirements are met is the obligation of the developer. And I think developers that aren't prepared to do that are the ones that are going to show themselves up as being the unscru on the unscrupulous side of the spectrum, whereas those are which are prepared to take the time and the thoughtfulness to do that will will find that this will get we will find a way through. So the very first thing to do is do your do do your homework and 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 find a design that really does work on a number of levels, not just on a financial return level. Thanks a lot. Um, Anita, what what would you like to add to to those points? So uh, my, my starting point is that these permitted development rights are in force at the moment. You mentioned, Karen, that there has been a legal challenge. Yes, um, a, a group of activists, environmental activists, um, have challenged these particular permitted development rights to allow you to build up upwards um, on dwelling houses and mixed and, and commercial buildings. Um, and so you're in a situation, if you're a developer thinking, what do I do now? It's a similar situation to what you could be in if you've got a planning permission in your hand and someone's put in a judicial review. And it boils down to what, what, is, what is your appetite commercially to take a risk and decide to continue to, to benefit and to take, make use of these PDFs? Yards, knowing in the background that there's a legal challenge, what would you do commercially? And I think you could have two camps of developers. Those who've got a bigger appetite for risk, um, who, who would proceed and, uh, and, and go through the prior approval process and make use of these permitted development rights. And then you've got a separate camp of developers who might want to just take stock and, and, and sit and watch the legal challenge Legal bits. This legal challenge, the courts have already recognised that this is a huge deal and it's got to be dealt with promptly. OK, it's going to be heard in the courts in the next few weeks in October, OK, between the 8th and the 15th of October. So I don't think about years and years of legal argument before 
you as a developer will know whether or not you can use these rights. OK, so that's the first thing to factor in when commercially you're thinking about what do I do next? OK, do you want to wait or do you want to crack on? OK, the second thing is if you do crack on. And these activists are successful. I mean. Of those who are challenging the rights, um, if they are successful and it leads to the rights being quashed or removed legally, theoretically, there is a risk that what you've done under the permitted development rights are now unlawful. And theoretically, there's a risk of enforcement action. Now, I'm stressing the word theoretically because by law, local authorities decide to take enforcement action they've got to satisfy a few tests they've got to think about is it expedient for us to actually go after those who've relied on these permitted development rights is it expedient in terms of time money resource okay and secondly would it be in the public interest now if you think about it the whole government sentiment behind introducing these P PDRs to extend upwards is to boost the economy, is to help construction, is to encourage development. So from a public policy perspective, question for local authorities, would it make sense if this legal challenge is successful for them to start going after loads of developers who have actually started using this permitted development right. So it really depends. Final legal point. As a developer, my advice is check whether these permitted development rights are actually available in the area that you're looking to develop in, because we've all heard of something called an Article 4 direction. Councils are allowed to disapply these PDRs. And I don't know if you all remember when the Office to Resi PDRs came in, loads of councils um, put in Article 4 directions to actually disapply them. Councils like in Westminster, Manchester. So please don't assume that they are available across the country. Please do your homework, as Brendan quite rightly said. But those are my legal thoughts. Thanks very much, Anita. That uh, extremely useful legal perspective there. Um, Jill, from from your uh, standpoint, what are the what's workable right now? How do you see it? So we're getting quite a lot of interest in the um, the two additional stories to buildings, which is the first announcement which was made. Um, and as I, the points that are coming through from the panel are, there's there's so much been happening in terms of uh, press around planning at the moment. There's a you know there's a whole range of things coming through from consultations, from the white paper, from the use class. So check very specifically on the on the PD rights you're looking to utilise check whether that right is being challenged and then you know exactly where you stand. So I think trying to cut through all the, the press and the political discussion and a whole range of stuff to get right to the nitty gritty of does this apply? Is this being challenged? What are the matters I have to consider? And going through and getting the technical assessments on those bits you do need to do. So, you know, you, you cannot stress highly enough how specific and um, tight PD regs are, these are the same as that, and they've changed a lot from previous PDR rights. So it's a case of even more doing your homework. So yeah, it's a case of, um, you know, checking in with, with your lawyers, scoping it out properly with your designers, and then checking on all your technical aspects, which we cover from, you know, the, the transport matters, there's new things to include. Um, so yeah, just bottoming out the letter of the law on it really, so you're as bulletproof as you can be. But then at the same time, these things normally settle down through case law and through appeal decisions. So particular authorities might take a different stance in relation to particular matters, and that does take time to settle down. Um, so yeah, you sort of need to proceed with caution based on that overall remit. Thanks very much, Jill. Um, Laith, what what sort of things are you seeing or looking out for in applications right now and what what would you think is the best um, move for developers wanting to access these rights and what should they look out for? Without giving away the magic secret, uh, no, um, we 
for us, business as usual, just referring to everyone's points, we have not changed the way we work because of permitted development. Actually, most of the projects we were looking at that are going forward, we're looking at them going, can we actually get permitted development on them? And we're saying, well, we need to put a lift on that. We can't put, we can't actually build on that because we can't put a lift on the outside. And so this, there was, like, back to, there were so many constraints to the permit development that actually it's probably easy to just submit a planning application um, and go through that process. But but anyway, that's that's my choice. Um, we the things we're looking at, we actually have had a live a live uh, pre app on 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 a permit development, and um, the council is not ready for it yet. They don't understand it. They don't understand what's what. They don't understand the details of it. And, and of course, that will take time. And, and like Jill said, over time as well, the legal challenges will come through. There are questions on things like principal part. You know, what does that mean? Uh, will they even say, if we're building on top of a three story building and we're putting two stories on, that will take it to five stories. We can't put a lift on. Hold hold on. That means people can't access the, the like we say, we can't access the fourth and fifth floors. You know, these things need to be looked at. But also, it's not, you know, we can't just throw two stories on top of a building. You know, you've got to make sure the structure's right. Can you legally build on the roof? Do you have a right to the roof? You know, these things, there's so much in there. But that is just what I, as a, or we as airspace, as an airspace developer, a leading airspace developer, do day in, day out. So like I say, business as usual for us. Um, it's exciting to have these. And we're getting a lot more people coming to us to say, look, can you help us build in our building? You know, will you join venture with us and all of that? But a lot of them, I'm just saying, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit the criteria, unfortunately. So it's not as carte blanche as everyone thinks. Um, and like I said, the first uh, instrument 632, which is where basically where we say building on detached built block, blocks of flats. There are not many attached blocks of flats out there that you can actually build on top of with this, with this permitted development. So yeah, keep saying it business as usual. Thank you. Um, Karen, can I just have, make a very quick point just for our listeners? Um, challenge. So as Leif very correctly said, uh, um, this legal challenge only applies to permitted development rights that have come into effect on the 31st of August that allows you to build extensions on dwelling houses and on top of offices, restaurants, financial and professional services, and certain mixed use buildings. Okay, so that's the chat, that's what the legal challenge relates to. It does not relate to permitted development rights that came into effect on the 1st of August that allows you to build above what Leif just mentioned a detached. Um, single purpose, I'm just going to get this, a detached block of um, flats, okay, that is different, that that um, particular permitted development right, which as Leigh correctly said, <clears throat> excuse me, is a very, very limited one anyway, that particular right isn't being challenged in the courts, but I think if any of our listeners need some more guidance, on what existing permitted development rights they can um, make use of, please get professional advice. It's really tricky to work out. Thank you. Thanks for adding that in, um, Anita. I must say a lot of the distinctions that are coming through in this conversation certainly do not feature in the press, in the majority of the press that I'm seeing. Um, as someone who has been scouring the headlines for the past couple of weeks, um, I'm certainly not seeing these nuances. There's a lot more around um, this sort of apocalyptic, the whole of the skyline changing and that sort of thing where I think there's a lot more uh, to discuss here.